All right, in this video, we're going to study Cayley's theorem. So this is the statement of Cayley's theorem. Let G be a group, then G is isomorphic to a permutation group. In other words, there exists some set X and some subgroup H in the symmetric group on X, such that G is isomorphic to H. So remember, the symmetric group on X consists of all permutations of X, so all bijections from X to itself, which is a group under composition. And a permutation group is any subgroup of SX. So remember, this is a set of all bijections. It's a group under composition. Of functions. And why was it a group? Because every bijection has an inverse. So what is the significance of this theorem? Well, originally in group theory, at the very beginning of the subject, the original definition of a group was just a collection of permutations closed under composition. And for finite groups, by the finite subgroup test, I mean subgroup criteria, and that's all you needed to be a group, a subgroup, was closure under the group operation. And so that turned out to be good enough, but eventually they realized for infinite groups you needed uh, closure under inversion as well. And Cayley's theorem was the one that established that this abstract definition group we use now was equivalent to the original definition they started with. So how do you prove it? Well, what do you need to find? You need to find a, a set X and an H. It, what Cayley did was he chose X to be the group itself. So now what do I need to do? I need to be able to find a way to construct a subgroup of this group that's isomorphic to G. Notice that this group is very big. It's order of G factorial, so if G had order N, this is N factorial elements, because it's actually just that much bigger. But it turns out this will actually work. So the strategy is going to be to define a certain injective function from your original group to this symmetric group that preserves products. Why? Because if it's injective, then if I replace this codomain with the image, I now get some, I can replace lambda with a surjective function. And then I can say G is isomorphic to the image of G under this uh, function. And that's what we're going to do. To me, the beauty of the statement is this function and its properties, rather than the theorem itself. However, you will notice very quickly that this is going to be a challenge, because what do I need to do? Given a group element, I need to create a bijection. So lambda of g is going to be an element in sg, which means it is a function. from g to g, that is a bijection. You'll see that uh, this will look kind of awkward because, well, how do I input an element? I guess two sets of parentheses. Well, that looks a little weird, so you're going to find that for the proof, we're going to use subscripts instead to denote this function, this permutation. And so instead of using the usual approach where I have parentheses, I'm using lambda sub g. And so for every group element, I want to create a permutation. So let's create that permutation. But well, one choice would be to multiply. So given any group element h, the permutation lambda sub g is going to multiply h on the left by gh. And so the questions you can ask is, is this actually a permutation? 
is, is it a bijection? One of the equivalent ways of showing something is a bijection is showing it's invertible. And I mentioned earlier before that this is one reason why we have this if and only if, because sometimes you show something's a bijection by showing it surjective and injective. And sometimes it makes more sense to just give, uh, write down the formula for the inverse and check that it's the inverse. In this case, it makes more sense to take that approach because the inverse permutation also comes from this construction. It's lambda sub g inverse. So that's why I want to do the, this version of the proof, because it actually highlights some of the aspects of group theory. You actually see why the uh, inverse, uh, inverse axiom is so important to the group. The inverse axiom is the reason why this left multiplication operation actually gives you permutation. So let's actually check that this is true. What do you have to do? You have to show composing lambda of g with lambda of G inverse gives you the identity, and lambda of G inverse with lambda of G gives you the identity. So I need to take another element of H, apply this function to it, and see that I get H. Well, let's do this calculation. If I apply this composition of two functions to H, well, by definition, lambda of G of H is G times H. So if lambda of G inverse of G H, Lambda of G inverse is just left multiplication by G inverse. So this ugly looking thing, it's just this triple product. Multiplication is associative, so I can move the parentheses over. G inverse and G cancel each other out, and I do get H. And you'll probably guess that the reverse calculation is going to be similar. So I'll just try to do it in one line one system of equations instead of a second system. But I could have actually just started writing this direction and from the bottom and going up instead. Just magically multiply by GG inverse, apply associativity, left multiplication by G is just applying lambda of G to G inverse H. Left multiplication by G inverse H is lambda of G inverse applied to H. I get function composition. Although most people would naturally have started with this and worked their way up. But for the sake of brevity, it actually works this way too. Equalities go both directions. So what do I see? I see for any H, these three things are equal. And therefore, lambda g inverse composed with lambda of g is equal to the identity function is equal to lambda of g composed with lambda of g inverse, which means lambda sub g inverse is the inverse of lambda sub g, which means that yes, lambda sub g is invertible, yes, it is a bijection, yes, it's in SG, I actually do, in fact, have a permutation. Oh, well, no, that's a mistake. Pause for a moment to do an example. We'll let G be the non-zero, I mean, the non, the units of Z mod 8C under multiplication. Those turn out to be 1, 3, and 5, and 7. So they're the numbers that have no common factors, I mean, uh, have GCD with 8 being 1, since 8 is a power of 2, means they have to be odd. So 1, 3, 5, and 7. You can check that these have inverses with respect to multiplication, modulo 8. In fact, actually, they're each their own inverse. Let's look at lambda sub 3. What is lambda sub 3? Well, 1, what are we doing? We're just multiplying by 3. 1 times 3 is 3, 3 times 3 is 9, 9 mod 8 is 1, so technically you should write the 9, but that's actually 1, so it turns out this is actually just a 2 cycle. 
Now what happens to 5? Five? 5 times 3 is 15. 15 mod 8 is 7. So 5 goes to 7. 7 times 3 is 21. 21 mod 8 ends up being 5. And so we see this permutation is 1, 3, 5, 7. Likewise, you can check that lambda 5 becomes 1, 5, 3, 7. And lambda 7 becomes 1, 7, 3, 5. And of course, lambda 1 is going to be the identity permutation. And so here we have lambda sending g to s1357. So a subgroup of s4. The corresponding subgroup is going to be the identity permutation and these other permutations. And that is our group. under Cayley's theorem, and that's what G is isomorphic to. So of course we haven't proven this step yet, but it's worth going through and showing what these permutations are. This is what happens when you do left multiplication by a given element. You do in fact get a permutation. All right, segue over with, back to the actual proof. How do you define this, this function in general? Well, given a group element, we send it to the, its permutation that we just defined. What do we need to show? Well, we need to show that this function, lambda, is injective, and we need to show that it preserves products. Then we are done, because then we claim that g is isomorphic to its image under lambda. So what does it mean to be injective? Well, suppose lambda of g was equal to lambda of h. That means that the permutation lambda sub g is equal to the permutation lambda sub h. Well, if you look at the previous examples, you'd notice the on the cycle with 1, the element next to 1 was g. So you can look what happens when you look at lambda sub g of e, the identity. And then lambda sub h is the identity. These have to be equal because these functions are equal. Lambda sub g, the identity, is g times the identity, is the g. This part's always true for any permutation coming from this construction. You can actually figure out which group element you came from by looking at what's next to the identity in the permutation. Similarly, lambda sub h of e is h. So what do we have? We have g is equal to lambda sub g of the identity is equal to lambda sub h of the identity is equal to h. So assuming that two permutations were the same, their group elements they came from were the same. Ergo, lambda is injective. Last, we need to check that for any two elements in the group, when you compose their corresponding permutations, you get the same permutation you would have obtained from the product g times h. So, because that's what it means for this to function we just defined to preserve products. Well, let's look at these two permutations on both sides. Let's see what happens when you take an element in K and compute, I mean an element in G, let's call it K, and let's compute these permutations and what they do to K. Well, it's lambda of G composed with a, lambda sub h of k. Well, lambda sub h of k is h times k. Lambda sub g of k is g times h times k. Multiplication is associative, so I can move the parentheses over. And lo and behold, I have left multiplication by g times h. 
and thus lambda sub g composed of lambda sub h is lambda sub g times h. By the way, I probably should have pointed this out earlier. The reason they use lambda is lambda starts with the, the letter L, and you're doing left multiplication. So that is actually why they use lambda for this homomorphism. And so this, homo this function is injective and preserves products. So G is isomorphic to its image under this function which is, in fact, a subgroup of this permutation group. Why? Well, yeah, we still need to show that. So there is Cayley's theorem. And it occurs to me now that there's still one gap in this proof, which is the proof that this image is, in fact, a subgroup. I can't believe the book glosses over that. We'll see why that is in a later lecture video when we talk about group homomorphisms. When we prove that the image of any subgroup of G is a subgroup of the codomain, and that will be good enough. So notice there is a gap in the proof, but we will fill the gap in later.